Hi, my name is Michelle Wood. I'm the educator here at the McGoffin Home State Historic Site. And today I kind of want to talk about the science of Adobe, but for non-scientists. First of all, let me just state that Adobe construction was something that was done in El Paso before the train arrives because the materials in Adobe are found locally. So even though it is an overlooked building style that we really don't see being used today unless it's reinforced Adobe, um, it really is the greenest, most sustainable form of construction we could possibly conceive of. Uh, if heaven forfend an adobe wall falls, you literally can pick the pieces back up, crush them, remix water in, and reform brick from the same material. Or if you don't want to go that route, you can just let it go. It's just ground going back into ground. So it is truly the most sustainable green building style you could possibly imagine. Now, having said that, uh, you know, it, it doesn't require an overly complicated process. In fact, the other day I did have one of our volunteers come up to me and ask the question, you know, did an architect have their hand in building the McGoffin home? And my answer, my quick answer was no, I don't think so. Because when the McGoffin home was built, utilities really didn't exist the same way they do today. And that, you know, when you're talking about building permanent structures, designing where the, um, what we call in the business MEP, your mechanical, electrical, plumbing, all go in the building, really is handled by an architect. They have to design the most efficient uh, manner for all these uh, utilities to be installed in the home so that they can be useful for a longer period of time, that they meet code, that they do not violate any sort of requirements uh, within your municipal systems. So it literally is just being concerned about does the wall stand uh, instead of where do I put the plumbing for the toilet or for the kitchen sink. Now, of course, the McGoffin home later on would be retrofit for all of these, and I'm sure that was probably more of a concern. But beyond that, uh, really, when you're talking about Adobe construction, it really is just the support of the brick of itself and can that wall stand. So let's talk a little bit about the science behind that and what makes an Adobe building work. First of all, let's start with the materials in the Adobe. Uh, there's really four main materials and uh, I'll explain a little bit what purpose each of those ingredients serves in the adobe brick. First of all, you've got your uh, soil, which is your aggregate, okay? It's, it's the silica material that really, once, once your media, your water comes out of it, kind of holds it together and makes it solid. Uh, the second ingredient that's important is clay. That's your binder. Uh, clay uh, is an incredibly small molecule. And um, that clay actually holds an electrical charge, and it's a weak ionic bond. The first science we've talked about so far. A uh, weak ionic bond that binds that aggregate, that soil together. Okay? Water is the media. That is what allows it to be moldable, movable, um, and allows it to be formed into the brick. And then in our case, there's the addition of straw. And it's just a small amount chopped and, and mixed into the mixture. And that helps redistribute the water through the brick so that as it's drying and baking in the sun, it doesn't curl. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I do want to take a moment and talk about why the adobe did fall out of fashion just really quick. Uh, once the train arrives, you know, up to this point, before the train arrives, building in El Paso really was adobe because, again, all those materials I just listed all exist around us. And so it was easy to build a building. You didn't have to wait for things to be wagoned in. And keep in mind, a wagon trip from Dallas to El Paso at that point was about two months, okay? And it was 
round the clock, out in the open, spending the night um, in, in inhospitable conditions. And so once the train starts delivering fired brick, lumbered wood, all these other materials, now they, they, people were looking at it as, at those materials and seeing those as modern and fashionable and looking at the adobe and overnight in the newspapers you can see the change of talking about old dusty adobes and how um, unfashionable they were uh, even though it was less expensive and more hospitable to the environment okay so as i discussed there are the four main, main ingredients and I do want to kind of touch on uh, clay for just a second because this really is, when you're talking about an adobe mix, clay is the vital thing that binds it all together, right? It's our binder. So clay molecules, there's many different kinds. There's things like kaolinite, bentonite, smectite. Um, many of these are found in our region. And uh, they... They have this uh, attribute that's known as plasticity, okay? Plasticity allows it to gain water. It'll actually swell, as you see in this diagram here. But it doesn't just carry water inside of it. It also will bind water on the outside of the molecule as well. And it's really, really tiny. When compared to a grain of sand, it can actually fit in in between grand, grains of sand and fill it in. But then it also will carry water with it. And the plasticity of it also allows it to be molded into a shape, okay? So there is a maximum water required to hold the shape, that's the plasticity, and the liquid load, which is the maximum water it will hold before it loses its shape. And we'll get a little bit more into that when I talk about some of the testing that gets done for adobe mixes. And the, again, I talked a little bit about the weak hydrogen bonds that happens with aggregates. But again, because of that electrical charge and because of its size, it will disperse between the molecules of your aggregate and it will carry the water with it because of those weak ionic bonds. And as the water dries out of these bricks, it replaces those weak ionic bonds to the water with weak ionic bonds to the aggregate or the soil that's in it. So it really, that's what sticks it together. So if I sure. understand, the ionic bonds are a bit like the glue that kind of holds those particles together. Yes. They're an attractive force instead of a repellent force. Right. I don't remember high school science No, much. it's okay. <laughs> so if you have like, let's say, you know, the old diagram with the circle with the nucleus, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then you have all the electron shells on the exterior, clay, because uh, its size and because of its formation, it has a few extra electrons that will actually loan itself to the silica in the soil. And so it, it will go in and out between that, cool. that aggregate and the clay, okay? And originally, it'll start off doing it with the water because water tends to have, it's, there's a reason why we call water a universal solvent because it too has electrons to share and it has holes in its electron shells mm -hmm. and it can take in those electrons it's why it takes salt so well. Um, it, will, it will create solutions so easily because it's literally sharing its electrons. Well, you've got now two things that want to share electrons. They're just looking for those extra electrons and they're looking to share the ones they have. So again, because it is so small and because it does hang on to that water so well, it'll move in between those little soil uh, uh, grains and really get in there and share electrons. And once you get that water out of there, now it's looking for something else to share an electron with, so it'll move to the soil. So let's talk about some of the tests that are available to really um, test for adobe. So of course you can do more modern ones. Um, there are things like pressure tests where they use you know, weights and, and um, 
um, uh, all sorts of like chemical tests. You can run them through uh, scanning electron microscopes and, and um, spectrometers and all sorts of things to tell exactly what's going on. But it's really not necessary. Uh, back in the day, they used to do three simple tests. One is a clay content, which you soak it. A test for the, the, um, the maximum water load, liquid load, and plasticity of the clay, which is you squeeze it. And a test for durability, which you just drop it. <laughs> so the first test, the soak it. You literally take a mason jar, you take some of your adobe mix, you put it in there and you put in water, doesn't matter how much water, you shake it up and you let it set. This is after shaking it for 20 and leaving it set for 24 hours, and this is four days. And you literally can see the, the different components settling out once you've, once you've inundated it with water. And you're looking for about a 25% clay layer, one quarter of it. It can go up to 27%. And that clay content, you want to keep it between 25 to 27% because any more than that and your brick will crack. It doesn't have enough electrons to bind to, right? Or it will um, not hold together at all. It'll just break apart because it has too many, uh, it doesn't have enough electrons to share with the aggregate that's in there. Now, the squeeze it test which you can kind of see here. Once you, you know you've got enough water in your mix, if you can take a handful of the clay and squeeze it and pull your hand away and it leaves the shape of your hand in the clay. The clay holds its shape. If it goes <laughs> you've got too much water. Or if it breaks apart once you move your hand away, it doesn't have enough. The durability test, the drop it, to see if it's gonna hold up, if it's strong enough. So what they would do is take their dry, ready-to-go brick, they would hold it at waist level and drop it on the ground. If it broke or cracked, then it wasn't strong enough. And they had to look at their clay mix in that. Um, and uh, that would have to be adjusted depending on whether it broke or not. If it didn't break, great. You've got the right mix, right? So now, Let's talk a little bit about construction. Once you've got your mix right and your bricks are all dry and they're ready to go, how do you actually construct with the bricks? So there's a few basic rules. First of all, brick layout is the key to stability. Um, I'll show you a little bit of a diagram in a minute, but when you're laying it out, you don't want seams to all line up because then it becomes like this independent, they're not, lock together. They're, they can move independently and that makes your wall really unstable. Another key rule is that thickness of the wall determines how tall it can be. And the general rule is that walls can only be 10 times as tall as they are thick. So if you have a one foot thick wall, it can only be 10 feet tall. The thicker the wall, the taller your walls can be. And like in the McGoffin home, that's really important because our walls are two and a half to three feet thick which technically they could go up to 30 feet. They're not, they're 16 feet. But that extra thickness is providing a stability. And keep in mind, they're also slightly wider at the base, almost like a pyramid. You know, in, in geometry, we talk about pyramids being the most stable construction that there is because that base, it makes it almost impossible to tip over. All structural support is provided by the brick and any posts and lintels added to create the open. So if you have a door or a window, there's a post and lintel system, and I have some pictures of what that looks like that I'll show you here in just a minute. And then, of course, something to consider, something that we run into is maybe think about your, the foundation. Keep in mind, clay, even after it's dry, it still is hydrophilic, meaning it loves water. And Dry adobe brick has capillary action, meaning if there's any source of water next to it, the brick wants to suck it up in there. The clay is really attracting that water. And so if you've got it directly on the ground like we do, 
then maybe planting right next to the building and knowing you're going to have to water it, that's something to think about. Okay. So just to kind of give an illustration of brick layout, over here you can see you have a seam on this um, level right here, but the next level seam is over here and up there. So you're staggering those seams so it's interlocking the layers of, of bricks and right now courses. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's what you call it, Mason. You're in courses. So each course, the seams are going to be not lining up. They're going to actually split the, the center of the brick after it, in the course after it. And when you're talking about laying out, and this is very similar to the way it's laid out in the McGoffin home, you'll notice you have long sides and you have short sides. When you're building walls two bricks thick, like we have, it's not uncommon to turn your bricks on another course. And that, again, bumps up that stability because now you've got the longer seams even crossing longer seams. Mm -hmm. um, the more you can make crosses out of those seams, the better. Yes? Which is better, that one? Well, I think it depends. If you're building two bricks wide, this is a really good method. It's mm -hmm. very stable. Very stable. Very stable. Um, if you're building only one brick wide, then this is what you're aiming for. If you were to build your house, you use that one? Uh, yeah. If I, if I were to build an adobe today, I definitely would shoot for a two-foot thick yeah, wall. That sounds better. Huh? Yeah. Um, you know, you, the art, art factor on uh, adobe is incredible because it is solid. Um, so typically one of the fun things... Uh, about Adobe is that the reason it will keep you cooler during the day and warmer at night, which in the desert took me a few years to realize not everyone deals with this, but we have a temperature variation of around 30 degrees during day to night. Not everyone gets that. I didn't understand that. Um, we may start off in the 50s in the morning, but we could end up in the 80s by the afternoon. So what happens in an adobe building is the sun will hit the wall during the day and heat it up. And the sun's rays are, are traveling and hitting it, and then they're traveling through the brick. They're warming up the exterior of the brick. And that travels through the brick so that at night, once the sun's gone down and you no longer have that heat source, that heat is still traveling through the brick mm -hmm. and will come out to the interior of the wall into your room and will actually it'll it'll even out the temperatures so that while on the outside you've got this big temperature change the walls are actually um, controlling the temperature in the inside of your home all the way through the night until the next morning when the sun hits it again and starts the whole process all over again so this is actually a heat source mm -hmm. at night because it takes that long to go through all that silica and clay. This is a post and lintel system, and this is actually straight from the McGoffin home. Um, during a period of restoration, they removed that candy shell from the exterior, the plaster, and uh, exposed the actual mud brick, and also the posts and lintels. So you can see at the top, the lintel actually goes in between two courses of the, the brick. And it has to, because again, Wherever this is, there's no support. You've lost all your support, right? This is your support because it's just brick stacked on brick. This now becomes the support for those bricks above that hole, that opening. And so that lintel has to be strong enough to carry all the weight. And I want you to keep in mind, in the McGoffin Homes case, our bricks are about 12 by 18 inches by about 5 inches thick, and they weigh about 50 pounds apiece. So... You know, if, if that window ends at, let's say, 10 feet off the ground, but there's still six feet above it, think about how many thousands of pounds of pressure is above it. So you have to have this nice, solid, thick piece of wood and then two posts. So these are your posts. That's your lintel. Your posts also have to be super strong to help support all that weight. And in the McGoffin home, we do have some places where there's actually bowing in those posts and lintel over time. Yeah. 
I am not an architect, but to my eye, it almost seems like the lintel is too short. Like if I were making it, right. I'd make it huge. Support as much as you can. Right. Is that just my inexperience speaking? Yeah, because <laughs> keep in mind, it's really the the po or the lintel that's going off the sides of the post really aren't providing any extra support because they are actually being supported by all of this. Okay. So really, it's the thickness that you would really want to be more concerned with. The strength of the wood, you want a harder species of wood, and you'd want it to be a thicker gauge, um, as opposed to necessarily the length coming off the side of those posts. Because mm -hmm. those, that, there is, you do want some of it because it will lock in that mm -hmm. lintel really well into the wall. That's where you want those hangs on the other side of the post to provide that just locking it into the wall. But really, uh, it only provides a minuscule amount of support. Most you, you really, I, to me, I, I'd, be, I, I'd be okay with, you know, six to eight inches off the sides, but maybe like a two inch wide thick piece of wood. And a really good hard species would be and you can see they, they really aren't so much concerned about this bottom support here other than where it's coming into the posts. Yeah. Did that thing pop off like that? I think so. That's what it appears to me, um, that that actually is just a break. Um, After all that pressure you were making? Yeah. In fact, there's, there's a few where we've got window sills. And actually, I found a case study, and I can tell you why that happens. Yeah. So the inside scoop on that is um, that happens when there is moisture coming up and the clay is swelling from underneath and pushing the wall. And so it's, so these posts have an, a, a down action on them from all the weight of the brick above them. This only has really the effect of this underneath. Mm -hmm. And so as that's swelling and pushing up because of all the capillary action in the water, it's pushing up on that, on that windowsill there. Mm. I know, kind of crazy, right? It's very easy to think about the building settling, but it's weird to think about this building rising. <laughs> and it is, it is, and that's, that's just how powerful clay can be, you know, um, because we do have thrust formation mountains in El Paso, because we also have the river, which breaks down um, a lot of minerals um, to that extra fine clay. Um, between those two, the water runoff in the mountains and the <clears throat> water in the river, um, our clay content here is ridiculous. <laughs> it's, it's very easy for us to get a good adobe mix off just our brown soil. Mm -hmm. it's Even very, today. It's very good here. It is, and it's, it's prime. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that adobe construction is great for every place. You know, we do have an average rainfall of about eight and a half to nine inches a year. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't have, in fact, the introduction of non-indigenous plants and the watering that is involved to keep those non-indigenous plants alive in our desert climate is, is probably the most detrimental factor when talking about adobe construction. But if you're good with going with more indigenous grasses, more indigenous plants, and not watering all the time, really, you know, this is the way to go. And some of the foundation, uh, in fact, we recently just had an architect come in and talk about the fact that in California, where they do have a higher rainfall, one of the things they would do, uh, they wouldn't necessarily build a foundation, but wherever they were starting their walls, they would dig these trenches and they would line them with shale rock and um, gravel because those don't have the ability to suck in water like clay does. So it was, it was in a way building in this really quick foundation of rock that isn't going to take in the water mm -hmm. under the walls. So it would break the, the capillary action of the brick directly on the ground and soaking up groundwater. Kind of brilliant. <laughs> but again, all sorts of things to consider if you want to build 
uh, in Adobe Construction. I do have a few examples of some resources that include, um, believe it or not, the Secretary of Interior does have standards for Adobe um, for the restoration of it. Uh, that's actually the top link that you'll see there. And then you have some other uh, discussions of clay and what clay does, why it works, what can um, destroy your clay, things like that, so that um, you really can examine all of the science behind the clay. But again, I'm keeping this down to really just the basic working knowledge. Um, but if you would enjoy more, please. Um, and thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it.